So, a few quick disclaimers. If you've come to see this talk, we really hope you have familiarity with zero knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption, commitment schemes, and we're really hoping to provide as unbiased of a discussion as possible here. If you feel like we're not doing a good job of that, and please be, feel free to call us out. So, what is a privacy preserving smart contract? There's a few different like components and properties of privacy preserving smart contracts that we're going to go over and like exactly what defines them. Um, in our case, privacy is defined by two properties, confidentiality and anonymity. And what we define privacy as, in this case, is that confidentiality is when we can hide the input and the outputs of that, uh, that state machine's program. Uh, so, for example, like in a Solidity smart contract, we all know that the inputs are not private, everybody can see them. Uh, as well as they are also not anonymous. They're, the inputs are not confidential, and also they don't hide the users involved in that computation. So we have two uh, properties that we're defining. That is confidentiality, so that's like the bare minimum, which is like just inputs are hidden. And then an anonymity would be like a more complete solution where it implies confidentiality. Um, you're probably familiar with some of the use cases for smart contracts, in case you didn't know. Smart contracts are also a form of private transaction. So like a Bitcoin transaction is a smart contract to some extent. So in the case of private transactions, there are a few implementations of these. Zcash, Monero are the two major ones. Um, private voting is another use case where people actually need to have their some privacy, some degree of maybe even anonymity when they vote uh, to cast ballots. As well as um, auctions. Uh, there's a really uh, big market for blind auctions and, to, and keeping who is paying for what and how much they're paying private. Um, so. Moving on. So what are some considerations for a privacy preserving smart contract? Uh, in our talk, we're mainly going to focus on transaction privacy. And the reason why is because transaction privacy is a small subset problem of, private, uh, trans of uh, privacy preserving smart contracts. And the cool thing about transactions is that when you make them private, you can actually sometimes generalize these. Uh, into more broad definitions of smart contracts, so we can actually make them do more computations that don't that aren't just transactions, but maybe involve like whole state machines and whole execution. We'll be getting more into that later. So we believe there are four main considerations that go into actually developing a privacy-preserving smart contract. So we've separated these out into efficiency, privacy, security, and functionality. Within each of these, there's a lot of complexities. So in efficiency, you can ask yourself, how long does it take to actually generate a transaction? What about verifying a transaction? What is the actual communication complexity? Setup string size, setup time, reference string size. What are the hardware resources required? Some zero knowledge proof systems do have a lot of hardware resources required, and they tend to gloss over that aspect. And how does it actually scale? With privacy, as we mentioned before, can we provide confidentiality or anonymity? And is the privacy based on cryptographic techniques? So do we have some provable form of privacy? Or are we using other techniques such as tumblers for anonymity or stealth addresses? Security has similar considerations. Is the security based on cryptography? Do we have provable security? Or is security based on non-cryptographic techniques? We can look at trusted setup. We also have to consider non-standard cryptographic assumptions, such as using the algebraic group model, knowledge of exponent, which are slightly non-standard. And we have to consider what kind of adversary is our scheme actually secure against, a post-quantum one, a semi-malicious one. And then finally, and arguably to us, the most important consideration is functionality. When you're talking about developing a PPSC, can you actually adapt your scheme to new settings? Is it possible to really express any arbitrary computation with your scheme? And more importantly, is there support for stateful computations like Ethereum? So that leads us into what we believe are the four definitions for these qualities. For efficiency, in the ideal world, it should be quick to generate and verify transactions. Setup should be fast. There should be a small communication cost. It should be efficient when scaling, and minimal hardware resources are required. With privacy, we should be able to get anonymity, not just confidentiality. It should be based solely on cryptography. 
Security is similar. It should be based solely on cryptography. We do not want to use a trusted setup, both for security and functionality reasons. And it should be secure against strong adversaries. We've left this deliberately ambiguous because it depends what you can achieve in your scheme. And finally, for functionality, we should be able to check off all three boxes that we just saw. We want it to be easily to, easy to adapt to new settings. We should be able to express any kind of program with our scheme. And finally, it should support stateful computation. So how do we actually achieve these four characteristics? We're going to focus exclusively on the cryptographic techniques because we believe in provable security and privacy. The first one we're going to look at is, of course, zero-knowledge proofs. And there are three main schemes that everyone's familiar with, SNARKs, STARKs, and Bulletproofs. So for SNARKs, they have trusted setup. However, that allows us to get the smallest proof sizes out of the three and the fastest verification possible. But they also use a slightly non-standard cryptographic assumption, which is knowledge of exponent. Starks are arguably an improvement on Snarks in that they have no trusted setup, and they use a much better understood hardness assumption of hash functions. But that comes at the cost of incredibly large proof sizes compared to the other two, and some expensive hardware is needed in the form of extra RAM to actually get the efficiency they talk about. Finally, with bulletproofs, they fall somewhere in between the two. There is no trusted setup, which is fantastic. They have moderate proof sizes, but they have some of the worst verification times. However, they can be improved when batching them together. And they're based on well-understood hardness assumptions using discrete blocks. So if we look at the three and see how they compare in terms of the four qualities, we've ignored privacy because arguably all zero-knowledge proof systems better provide confidentiality. In terms of efficiency, SNARKs come out ahead with the smallest proof sizes and the fastest verification. However, due to their trusted setup, functionality is impacted a lot. It's very difficult to port the scheme into new settings. Starks have very poor efficiency, as you see, because they need additional hardware resources and they have absolutely giant proof sizes. But they do very well in security and functionality, as do bulletproofs. And bulletproofs fall somewhere in between the two. So that leads us into the next building block that Tux is going to tell us about. So the next one is that it is called multi-party computation, something I'm probably sure a lot of you are already, already familiar with in the form of secret sharing schemes, such as Shamir secret sharing. Um, so, multi-party computation is a type of privacy-preserving computation technique which allows us to secure uh, the inputs to some uh, predetermined program. And we have multiple parties who collaborate together and work together to execute this program. And then the output, they should have a private output that only the person who requested that computation should know. Um, like I said, one of these examples should be your secret sharing, which you're all probably familiar with in like, the case of like wallets and, and how to just split up your wallets and share those. So, so maybe this is the, the, the most predominant issue that everybody should understand when we're talking about multi-party computation is how interactive it is. It is incredibly interactive depending on the number of parties you have. Uh, so anything more than usually two or three participants, we start seeing some really massive problems. And for many other protocols, it requires uh, something like zero knowledge proofs to keep the protocol actually fair. Um, so what that means essentially is we have like complexity layers in our uh, MPC protocols. At like the very first layer we can imagine the network. So all of our participants have to communicate with each other but we uh, start having similar problems to like traffic. You know when you get in a traffic jam the first person in the front of, of the traffic jam steps on the brakes which causes everybody else to step on the brakes as well. <laughs> So we start seeing network latency filter through the entire, and propagate through the entire network like that. And it causes massive problems, especially when a lot of communication is required for more complex things, like we can imagine for a privacy-preserving smart contract. Um, another thing is that it has game theoretic in, uh, security sometimes where uh, we, we may require an honest majority. And to keep things fair, we require another layer of complexity, like that's what I was talking about, the zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, where we start having to integrate proofs to ensure that everybody is acting appropriately. And if we start doing this, now we're talking about a very complex and long protocol. So in our next slide, we'll be talking about some implementations of privacy-preserving smart contracts. 
So two of the most recent approaches that are based on Ethereum are Aztec and Caesar. Both of them allow us to perform confidential transactions on Ethereum. Aztec uses a UTXO model, whereas Zether uses an account-based model. Both of them, in theory, are able to achieve anonymity. However, Aztec uses self-addresses, which doesn't really satisfy the cryptographic definition of privacy we want. Zether does do ring signatures. However, it's too expensive to implement on Ethereum as is. Zether is a lot more mathematically sophisticated. It comes from the same authors of Bulletproofs and utilizes commitment schemes, LGO encryptions, and it actually combines Bulletproofs and Sigma protocols into something called Sigma Bullets. Aztec is significantly simpler, but they use a trusted setup. They're a lot more efficient than Zether, and they just rely exclusively on commitment schemes and Sigma protocols to achieve this. So what do Zether and Aztec have in common. Uh, when we're talking about they both use algorithm encryption, what they're actually using, utilizing is a property called additively homomorphic uh, encryption or even commitment schemes. So what does it mean to be additively homomorphic? Um, when we have two, we'll, get, we'll talk about different types of uh, homomorphisms, but in the case of additive homomorphism, we can imagine that we have an encryption of some of a value A and an encryption of a value B. And if we take these two ciphertexts and perform an, an, an addition operation on the two ciphertexts, we actually get the encryption of what would be the output if you had just added the two plain texts together, except they're now encrypted. Um, so how this is built around to pre, uh, build actual confidential transactions is we have an encryption of a balance, say the number three. And then we have an encryption of a transfer amount say a number like negative two, you're sending two coins to somebody. So when you take your encrypted balance of three and your encrypted balance of negative, or your encrypted transfer of negative two and you add them together, you get one. So that would be the encryption of the balance after that transaction in general. So it essentially lets you, and out of the homomorphism is simply a way to map between these two domains. We have the plain text domain where we're all familiar with just doing simple addition on, on things, and the, and the encrypted ciphertext domain, where we don't normally see what the value is underneath, but we know it's some value. Uh, the additive uh, homomorphism is simply an operation, an addition operation, that lets us calculate what that value would be in the plain text space. So you can simply add ciphertext together to get their plain text output. So. That, that, yeah, that, that leads us into, into the fully homomorphic encryption, which yes. that's all we'll talk about. As we just saw, some schemes do utilize homomorphic addition to perform confidential transactions. If you actually extend that and consider homomorphic multiplication, which means that the encryption of A times the encryption of B is the same as first multiplying A and B together and then encrypting it. So what might happen if we were to create a PPS scheme that doesn't only just do homomorphic addition, but also does homomorphic multiplication? that would actually give us something that performs fully homomorphic encryption. There hasn't been any PPSC scheme that does fully homomorphic encryption so far, but it might be interesting to consider how much more power we would get from including this in such a scheme. We're gonna quickly look at two non-Ethereum approaches. One is Zexy, which uses the UTXO-like model. They use ZK Starks for performing confidential transactions. And they actually have an even stronger notion of privacy than the one you defined. In addition to hiding the inputs and outputs of a function, they also discuss hiding the function itself, so what we can call function privacy. However, to achieve the efficiency that they're talking about, it's also an expensive scheme in the sense that you need hundreds of gigabytes of RAM to get the proving times they're talking about. And there's a second one from Oasis Labs. We don't actually know how to pronounce the name, so we're just going to refer to it as a project from Oasis Labs. They use trusted hardware, which does not satisfy our notions of security and privacy with cryptography, so we're just going to gloss over their work, but they're also in this space currently. Um, so, briefly, we'll talk about some comparisons between the technology. Um, so, it's really difficult to actually compare these technologies because they all accomplish uh, similar things with different techniques, and it's they're just not really that easy to compare together uh, directly. But they do satisfy some properties we can discuss, such as performance, privacy, the interactivity involved, and the cryptographic security used. 
Uh, so for fully homomorphic encryption, it is compli entirely compute bound. Uh, so the performance is basically built on, is, is on the, just depends on how well your computer can actually perform these uh, really intense operations, such as FFT. Um, the privacy is also based on the encryption scheme, which if you're familiar with any uh, cryptographic uh, security assumptions, I mean, uh, standards, we can say that, you know, usually just assume that it's IND CPA secure. Um, it is non-interactive, meaning that you don't have to interact with a bunch of people to perform this computation. You only need to go to the computing party, encrypt some data, give them a key, and they can usually perform the computation on it. And it also satisfies some cryptographic security as well. Uh, so we know that when we do uh, a fully homomorphic encryption, uh, we know that it's going to satisfy a mathematically hard problem that's not easy to solve. Uh, and like I said, MVC is network bound, and it becomes an issue when you have more and more participants in it. Uh, it's based on, encryp on an encryption scheme and non-collusion of that from the privacy. So for Shamir secret sharing, you're pretty much assuming that your friends won't get together and try to screw you over. Um, it is interactive, so it doesn't satisfy that. And the cryptographic security is somewhat similar, uh, that it requires, usually it has some fairness assumptions that requires usually some zero knowledge proofs to actually do it. Trust hardware is kind of, you know, bullshit in my opinion. Um, it's, it's, it's just based on hardware security, which if you've been paying attention to the space recently, you know, we have spec, Spectre, Meltdown, speculative execution attacks. That, like, we've been trying for years to make secure processors, and they're not working out that well. So it's time, the advancements that it's going to take to make secure processors a real secure thing is much longer than it will be to take these theoretical advancements to improve either FH or MPC. So let's just move on and do actual provable security and not just deal with the stuff that kind of but doesn't work. So that's, I have a lot of feelings on trusted hardware. <laughs> so if I could just look at some of the privacy preserving smart contracts approaches so far, we've already seen Zether, and it really optimizes for security in the provable sense. We briefly seen Aztec, but arguably they're not a PPSC scheme. They're just trying to perform confidential transactions. They really optimize for its efficiency. Zexi does a fantastic job optimizing for privacy, and Hawk, which we haven't really mentioned, but is a lesser known project than Zcash, doesn't really do a good job with any of them. However, the most important thing to focus on is that none of the approaches so far has actually tried to optimize for functionality. So it might be interesting to consider what happens if we pick a PPSC scheme. <laughs> what happens if we pick a PPSC scheme that optimizes for security, privacy, and functionality, and gives a little for efficiency and compromises a little there instead? And for everyone else in the room that might not care so much about that, when you're developing your, your own PPSCs, you should really look back at the chart and consider which of the four properties you've seen do you really want to optimize for. So that's it. Thank you so much. We have do roughly we have time for questions? 30 seconds. Yeah, one. Maybe one, one question. question. Yes. yes. Uh, could you explain why you consider uh, Bulletproof more secure than Starks and Starks more secure than Snarks? So I don't believe I said that Bulletproofs are more secure than Starks. I think you in, in uh, with uh, dots. Let's go back to the slide. That, that was the slide. Oops. You, you missed it. And, uh, press it time. I pressed the button too many times. Oh, so okay. I didn't. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, so why uh, Starks are more secure than Starks, in your opinion? I do think Starks are more secure than Starks. I don't really agree with trusted setup. Security can be compromised if the parties collude together. And I think knowledge of exponent is a non-standard assumption that's not well understood. So I personally, as a cryptographer, wouldn't feel comfortable using it. Other people might feel differently. But according to my definition, I think Starks are a little less secure than Starks and Bulletproofs. And why Bulletproofs? Uh... Bulletproofs are based on discrete log and the discrete log problem, and that's a very well understood cryptography assumption that's been around for a long time. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Bulletproofs are based on discrete log uh, only if uh, you, uh, you make them interactive, right? To make them non-interactive, you require uh, random oracle, the same as yes. Starks, right? 
Yes. And there are no Oracle is a, is a, I agree from a security point of view equivalent to knowledge of X. I don't know if that's true. I agree random Oracle is a slightly non-standard cryptographic assumption and a lot of things use that. If you want to ever turn a proof non-interactive, you almost always need the option here and you're going to get a random Oracle out. So it depends person to person what you feel most comfortable with. I think this is just an opinion and I understand that other people maybe not, don't feel so comfortable with random oracles and don't want to use that in their own scheme. For many cryptographic use cases, it would be better for us to utilize things. It's great that people want to utilize knowledge of Exponent. It'll honestly help us find, if, you know, understand it more as people implement it. But for many use cases when we want to build uh, for the long term in the future, we want to use stuff that we know and understand very, very well now, which is the random oracle model, which is the discrete log, the uh, log driven problem as well. Uh, so, I, yeah, I would also agree that knowledge of exponent is not very well, as well understood as either discrete log or uh, random oracle model. But it's been around the same time as uh, discrete it's log. Not, I don't think it's been as well studied. Oracle. I that, would argue it's not been as like well studied and used quite as much to have as good of an understanding, but I'm happy to talk with talk to you about this like afterwards if you're still interested. And even setting aside the hardness metric, obviously the trust setup that Dr. Paul says loses starts one of the dots. You know, so yeah, but uh, the trusted setup was part of the functionality. Uh, so that's also that's part strange. of security. Okay, so At least to us, that's part of security. Can, yeah, there. Yeah, but I think we can also argue that using cache and yarn because the number of rounds is also kind of like a heuristic and not very well put. So you have pros and cons on those systems anyway, because here it's, it's going to be used uh, on logarithmically, uh, on the logarithmic number of rounds, which is you have to be secure, but not going to be secure. So, like you would, you're not going to use, uh, you have a, a logarithmic number of, uh, of, uh, of interactions in the, in the interactive protocol, and to make it more interactive, you need to use cache and here, but it's actually not used to. So, people are very secure, but I haven't seen any more from that. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.